So tonight's talk, the topic is Kusala, Punya and Parame, or better known in English as Good, Merit and Perfection. So now we would like to invite the Venerable Sirs to deliver his talk. Venerable Sir, please. Thank you, Sister Eugene. Good evening, Venerable Members of the Sangha, Dharma relatives and friends. I'm very honored tonight to be given this wonderful opportunity to share the Dharma with all of you here. Speaking the Dharma, as you all know, is considered to be one kind of merit. So too is listening to the Dharma. We, as speaker and audience, should perhaps also be thankful to the Asan Belia Buddhist Malaysia for organizing this series of pre Mahasangika Dana Dharma talks. And since they have provided us this service, they too are doing a meritorious deed. So it seems that all of us here tonight are involved in doing meritorious deeds. Organizer, speaker, as well as the audience. Merit, as you know, is one of the topics that we will talk about tonight. The word merit used in a circular sense may have a different meaning from what I intend tonight. You may have heard of the word meritocracy. That involves giving reward to people according to their merits. There will be merits in terms of ability, intelligence, drive, aggressiveness, in worldly things like marketing, sales, managing, business, and so forth. In a corporate world, people are given incentives according to their merits. The more they perform, the more hardworking they are, the more intelligent they are, the more creative and resourceful they are, the more they are rewarded. From the circular point of view, that is considered to be merit. From the moral and spiritual point of view, which we will be dealing with tonight, merit is concerned with a different sort of value. Among Buddhists, I think we are very familiar with the words Gusula, Punya and Parami, especially among Theravadins. The people in Penang, I'm sure, are very familiar with the word Tambun. Now that is Penang Hokkien. If you go down to the south, JV or in other parts of Malaysia, and you say Tambun, people might not be able to understand what you mean. Actually, the word Tambun comes from the Thai word Tambun, and Tambun is somewhat related to the word Punya. Tam is to do. Boon is the Thai short form of the word Punya, which is normally translated as merit. In Burma, they use the word Punya in a different sense. The word Bong Jide, Bongang Jide, that is a Burmese word, which means that one has done merits before in the past, and one is now enjoying the results of one's good karma. For them, good is Gangmu Kudo. Gangmu means good. And Kudo is actually a Burmese pronunciation of the word Kusala. Kusala is normally translated as skillful or wholesome. It can also mean being impeccable, faultless, blameless. In the earliest Pali scriptures, particularly in the four Nikayas, the words Kusala and Punya are used with very little difference in meaning. They are rather synonymous. The word parami, which is usually translated as perfection, does not find itself mentioned in the early scriptures, in the four Nikayas, but only much later, in what modern Pali scholars regard as later editions of the Pali canon, in the Kuruka Nikaya, in books like the Charya Pitaka, Buddha Wangsa, and so forth. In the Vinaya Pitaka, there is often a usage of the word punya, in a rather bad sense, not a very flattering sense. If one who has renounced the world and become a monk or a nun finds that he or her practice is not up to one's expectations, then there is often a thought that occurs, what if I were to disrobe and become a layman? Then I would be able to do punya, do merit, observe my precepts and go to heaven so that next time I may have a better opportunity to practice for liberation. 
there is a connotation that punya refers to worldly merits, merits that give results in a worldly sense. Parami, on the other hand, is quite different from merits in the sense that its purpose is not to give worldly benefits, but its ultimate aim is for total liberation and freedom from samsara, for total purification of one's heart, so that one can be moved by pure compassion to help others more effectively. I like to classify good according to various subsets. Let us say that gusala is a generic term and punya is a subset of gusala. So is parami, an even smaller subset of gusala. To give you a worldly example, all women are considered females, but not all females are women. So the word female refers to a generic term, but the word woman refers to a special type of female. Human females are called women, not female dogs, which are called bitches, or cows, or hens. Now, out of those human females who are called women, not all of them can qualify to be a Miss Universe or a Miss World, right? So a Miss World or a Miss Universe is actually an abnormal creature, because a normal woman would not qualify to be a Miss World. A Miss World or a Miss Universe is an exceptional woman. So too is Parami. Although Parami and Merit can be classified under Kusala, a wholesome, skillful, good, Parami is a very rare and exceptional, wholesome deed. Merit is also a subset of Kusala, and according to its usage in the scriptures, it refers to the karma that is performed and that will give worldly benefits. Chief Reverend used to give an example. Merits will bring you to heaven and allow you to play mahjong up in heaven. And after you finish playing mahjong, that's it. That's the end of it. You come back and start all over again. What he's trying to say, I think, is that merits will be able to give you worldly results but they will not lead you to total liberation and freedom from samsara. In fact, during the Buddha's time, it is very common for people to make wishes and vows when they give dana. We can find that scattered throughout the commentaries, where they tell us of a certain lay disciple who is desirous of wanting something worldly very badly. She will wait for a monk, a highly attained monk, to come along and then they will give alms and make a wish. Or better still, some of them would invite the Sangha headed by the Buddha, make a Mahasangika Dana and also make a wish. May I be not so ugly in my future lives. May I be so beautiful that all men will fall in love with me. Well, there is a case in the Jatakas, I think. And that woman, later on, she was born and was called Umadanti. She's got such beautiful teeth that whoever looks at her smile would fall head over heels in love with her. That's why she's called Omar Dandi, mad teeth. There are also cases of people, men and women, who were very inspired by the great disciples of the Buddha. And they also made vows to be like their great disciples in future lives. So they too make Mahasangika Dana and they make a vow. By the power of this dana, may I be like your greatest disciple who is famous for his psychic powers, for his wisdom, or for his oratory skills. People do make such worldly vows. This tradition and custom prevails up to this day. Very often, when monks go out for Pindavad, we can see old ladies coming with ampals and dropping them into the bad or offering food and they will be mumbling something. Maybe may I strike or digit next week or something like that. Now, people do make all sorts of vows, you know. May I pass my exam, may my son study hard, may he pass the exam and so forth. There is nothing wrong with making such vows. The only drawback is that if one makes such vows, then one's merit or punya 
will be directed towards that particular goal only. Like what Chief Reverend says, he will take you up to heaven where you can play mahjong, and after that you come back again. Whereas punya or merits are motivated by selfish aims, paramis are motivated by altruistic aims, motivated by compassion and skillful means and intelligence. Let us take, for example, dana, giving. On the worldly level, giving as merit or punya would be motivated by some selfish aims. Give arms so that you will get rich in this life or maybe in the next life. So that you may be born in a very wealthy or fortunate family. What sort of dana qualifies to be a parami, a perfection? Dana that is given without any selfish motives. Dana that is given purely for the benefit of the recipient. Dana that is given without discrimination. Uh, I remember reading a book by Venerable Sewanno, his biography. About 20 years ago, when he first became a monk, he had great difficulty going around begging for alms. People did not know the benefits of giving. He wrote about a lot of humiliation that he had to go through because people looked down upon monks as beggars during that time. After that, he began to give a lot of talks on the benefits of dana and almsgiving, drawing from a lot of stories from the Jatakas, Beta Wutu and Vimana Wutu. Now, 20 years later, Penang is a famous place for monks to go for Pindabad. In whichever part of Penang that you go to with your bowl, you can get many things. Food and even Ang Pao, which of course a monk is not supposed to accept. So the people who have been educated to understand the benefits of almsgiving are now giving because they know that they are poor or not wealthy because they did not do enough dana in the past. They do dana now so that they will be richer next time. That is motivated by something selfish. They also know that if we give dana to the Sangha compared to giving dana to a dog, for example, the merits would be different. They know that there is a hierarchy of merits or karmic returns involved in the virtue and spiritual attainment of the recipient. So it's not strange to find an educated Buddhist offering food to one bhikkhu saying, I give this to the Sangha from the four directions, just to get immeasurable benefits and merits, as the Buddha said. Although the merits may be immeasurable if one's state of mind is pure, in the sense that when one gives to an individual monk with a Sangha of the Four Directions in mind, then that merit would be immeasurable. It is true. It is immeasurable in terms of worldly benefits. But a person who wants to do dana as a parami, as a wholesome deed that will conduce to liberation and freedom will do dana without discrimination. He will not just give to the Sangha, but he will give anything that is useful and beneficial to anyone who needs it, provided of course he has the means to do so. Now I've been using the word parami since I started talking. Let me explain to you what it means. The commentaries say that the word parami is derived from the word parama. Parama means supreme. And parami means the conduct or character of a supreme being. Who is a supreme being? A supreme being is one who aspires to be a Samasambuddha, who aspires to attain enlightenment, various stages of enlightenment, so that he can be perfectly pure and be more effective in helping others. The Mahayanis use another word, paramita, and their etymology is a bit different. Instead of basing it on the root parama, they base it on the word para plus ita. 
parang ita, parang ita. Parang means beyond, and ita means gone. So paramita means gone beyond. Gone beyond what? Gone beyond selfish motivations. Gone beyond worldly aims and objectives. Basically, they mean the same thing. For a person who is intent on enlightenment in this very life or in future lives, he would want to cultivate as many conducive conditions as possible for his eventual enlightenment. And for a person to be able to perform wholesome deeds without any selfish motivations, without any worldly aims in mind, that person can be considered to be supreme. The Bodhisattva. Now, this is only a general introduction to Gusala, Punya, and Parami. To recapitulate, I gave you the analogy of the classification of females, women, and Miss Universe, which can be compared to the terms that we use: Gusala, Punya, and Parami. Now, the scriptures also have a list of items under these three categories: under kusala, under punya, and parami. If you will look at the handouts, you will see that there are some overlaps. Perhaps we could look at the handout, or those of you who are in front could look at the screen. These are classified as the three types of vichrita, unwholesome conduct. You see that there is abstention from killing, stealing, sexual misconduct, and lying, which are actually the four precepts which you took earlier. Malicious speech, harsh language, and frivolous talk is an extension of the fourth precept of lying. It fine tunes one's verbal conduct. Covetousness, ill will, and wrong view belong to the realm of the mind. And they can be controlled through meditation. Now let me explain a bit further on item number five, which is translated here as malicious speech. This is an English translation of the Pali word pisunawacha. Pisunawacha is a certain kind of malicious speech. It is speech that brings about disunity. Separation and disharmony. So, if someone were to carry tales in order to separate others who are living harmoniously together, then that will be classified under pisunawaja or malicious speech. Harsh language refers not only to vulgar words but also to words which hurt other people. This occurs particularly between people who are close to each other. I like to think of relationships or friendships as akin to flowers. Flowers are beautiful, aren't they? At the beginning, when a flower blooms, it's beautiful. You see the beautiful textures and colors, and also the fragrance of the flower. But all flowers don't last forever. Some of them last just for a day. They bloom in the morning and they wilt at night. Others last longer. Some orchids, for example, may last for several weeks. When friendships start to bloom, they are also very beautiful. People who begin to start a relationship tend to be very polite and considerate to one another. There is a lot of Perhaps meta, but as the relationship deepens, people tend to be a bit judgmental and critical of one another. Then they will say nasty things to hurt one another. That seems to be a very normal way things go. I see some smiles around. I think all of you who are involved in a relationship would understand this very well. So to abstain from harsh language. Means not only abstaining from vulgar words, but also from words that hurt your partner or those whom you love, are close to your colleagues, your friends, the members of the family. Covetousness here means to covet another person's property, either animate or inanimate. It's only a mental phenomena, but it is considered to be unwholesome. 
So when a thought arises in one's mind desiring something or somebody that belongs to someone else, then it will be wholesome to let go of the thought. Ill will, of course, is well known to everyone. It is an unpleasant feeling. To be rid of unpleasant feelings, of course, would be very pleasant. But it's not so easy unless one has practiced meditation before. The last one is abstention from wrong view. And it is also considered to be a kusala kama. So these ten items are considered kusala kama pata or wholesome causes of action. This is classified in the scriptures, but there are also other thoughts and emotions that arise in us which can be considered kusala or akusala, wholesome or unwholesome. To give a rule of thumb, any action, any physical, verbal or mental activity that is motivated by attachment, by aversion, dislike or delusion can be classified as akusala or unwholesome and vice versa. Any mental, verbal or physical activity that is accompanied or motivated by non-attachment Non-aversion and non-delusion can be classified as wholesome, kusala, skillful. Perhaps it might not be so apparent to you to use a negative term like non-attachment, non-ill will, non-delusion. A positive expression of that would be the opposite of attachment, which is giving, giving away. Giving away material things, animate things, inanimate things as well as giving away your defilements. What are our defilements? Defilements are negative states of mind. For example, anger, disappointment, sadness, sorrow. These are negative states of mind. These are unpleasant states of mind. And yet, perhaps you might think, how is it possible for a person to be attached to anger, which is so unpleasant? Now, let me ask you this question. Have you ever been angry with someone who did something very bad to you before? I'm sure you have, right? Is anger a very pleasant feeling? No. Okay. And yet, you can't help but thinking of that fellow who did something bad to you and suffer for hating him for that, for doing what he did to you. You see, that's attachment to anger. What more to say of attachment to things that we like? So non-attachment means giving away, giving away our defilements, letting go our negative mental states. Non-ill will means positively loving kindness, radiating thoughts of goodwill and well-being to others. If you practice metta meditation sufficiently, you will be able to radiate loving kindness even to someone whom you dislike, even to an enemy, to someone who has done something pretty bad towards you. Non delusion is actually an expression of wisdom. Now, the Buddhist understanding of the word wisdom does not refer to worldly wisdom, but to insight knowledge, insight wisdom. Knowledge of reality as it really is. So, in short, whatever mental states that are accompanied by attachment, ill will, and delusion can be considered akusala or unwholesome, unskillful, and evil. Although the word evil it might not be such a nice word to use, but I use the word evil in contrast to the word good. Conversely, any action that is motivated by non-attachment, alterity or liberality, by non-ill will or loving kindness, by non-delusion or by wisdom can be considered a kusala or wholesome action. Now that also refers to all merits and all paramis. All merits and paramis are kusala. They are all wholesome, skillful and good. Now let us go on to the next classification of merit. We have the ten Punya Kriya Vuttu, 
or ten bases of meritorious deeds. If you look at the list, dana is actually a repetition of non-attachment. Remember, we talk about non-attachment as charity or giving. Sharing your merits is also another way of non-attachment. People who are not familiar with Buddhist ways of thinking sometimes think that if we share something with others, we are losing something. Right? If you get your salary or your pocket money and then you share it with somebody else, you'll be poorer, right? But this is not the case with merits. If you share your merits with others, you increase your merits because sharing of merits is also one type of merit. And so too is rejoicing in others' merits. When people say to you, when people announce very proudly, you know, uh, last year I was the main Katina sponsor for such and such a temple. And if you say, oh, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu outside, but in your heart, you say, ooh, I wish I could do that also, you know, but I don't have the money. And you envy that person or you're jealous of that person in your heart, then that is not rejoicing in others' merits. That is a negative mental state which is considered unskillful or unwholesome. To envy others' success, to be jealous of others who are better than oneself. Moral virtue has already been dealt with at length in the first list, the ten Kusala Kamapata. Perhaps we could consider moral virtue as a merit when one makes a vow, for example. In Buddhist countries like Burma and Thailand and Sri Lanka, lay Buddhists would usually observe eight precepts on Uposatha day. Sometimes people do that because of some worldly reasons. They observe sila so that they can be reborn in a better existence. Now, if a person were to do a lot of dana, wishing for wealth and fortune in this life or hereafter, there is no certainty that that person will be born in a favorable realm of existence. Let me give you an example. I'm sure you have seen pets of wealthy people. Have you seen Alsatians, Pekingese, Chihuahua, Bulldogs, Dobermen and Dalmatians, or cats? who are pets of wealthy people. They live such luxurious lives compared to the people who are starving in Africa and India. The Buddha said in one of his discourses that if a person were to do dana and he did not observe his precepts, he may be reborn in an unfavorable realm of existence and yet reap the good results who are very wealthy and rich through unscrupulous means and they also do a lot of dana. They know the law of karma and they know that they have done a lot of unskillful and unwholesome actions in their livelihood because they earn a living through maybe drug trafficking or other forbidden livelihoods for Buddhists. So what do you think will happen to such people? They may be reborn as a royal elephant or raw stallion. So if you see these animals, these pets who are so fortunate living in wealthy families, I hope you will be stirred with Sangveda, a sense of urgency. In fact, I know of a devotee in Taiping who has a factory producing pet toys. At first, I didn't understand the word pet toys. And I asked him, what are pet toys? These pet toys, you know, are things that pets play with. Pets even have toys. Who would buy toys for pets in Malaysia? Says, no, no, no. I'm making all these for export, you know, to the US, to the West. It seems that in the West, rich people are very fond of pets. And sometimes they even bequeath their property to their pets after they die. This devotee was telling me of a documentary that showed that certain wealthy people in the West have made a will saying that after they die, their pet cat or their pet dog must be fed with a golden spoon, on a golden plate, and on a sofa, and so forth. So imagine that these animals, they must have done a lot of dana before in the past, but they did not observe their precepts. So make sure that if you do a lot of dana, 
observe your precepts as well. Reverence is the next item on the list. Reverence here refers to paying respect to people who are more elderly or have better virtues or higher virtues than oneself. This does not need any special explanation because it is rather ingrained in our culture. To Asians, it might be rather surprising that a child could call or address the parents by name. But I understand that in the US and maybe in Europe, in the UK, children address their parents by their names. Uh, this is of course unheard of in the East. The Buddha was very particular about reverence within the Sangha. Even if a person were to be ordained at a late age, he must still pay respect to a young monk who is senior to him in terms of vasa. Service was mentioned right at the beginning of the talk. A service here means providing voluntary service to help people. For example, what YBAM did tonight in organizing this series of talks it can also help in many, many other ways. If you do not have enough money to give charity, you can help in giving your voluntary services, whatever you are good at, for charitable organizations. Listening to the Dhamma and speaking the Dhamma are also considered to be merits. And one can straighten one's views when one listens to the Dhamma and discusses with others. Finally, when one has listened to enough Dhamma, one can also start to practice meditation. And these are all classified under merits. There is, as I said, an overlap because to abstain from ill will, covetousness and wrong view listed under the first column, one has to practice meditation. Now let us go to the ten items under paramis. Although there is some degree of overlap again, there are some items which are quite specific. Dana is again an overlap, so is moral virtue. Wisdom can be considered to overlap under meditation, and so does renunciation. Renunciation actually means jhana in its ultimate sense. Wisdom, of course, means the cultivation of insight wisdom, as well as worldly wisdom as is described in the Jatakas. In order for a person to attain his ultimate purpose of enlightenment and liberation from samsara, he has to also cultivate other virtues. For example, persistence, energy, patience, determination, and truthfulness. Now, as I said earlier on, all these paramis are motivated by unselfish aims, are motivated by compassion and skillful means. And that, of course, implies loving kindness. If one were to perform dana as a parami, one would do so indiscriminately, giving whatever is beneficial to whoever needs it, without calculating how much karmic returns one can get. But if one gives, thinking, may this giving conduce to my practice for liberation, so that when I am purified and liberated, I may help others more effectively, then that act of giving qualifies as a parami. But it is normal for people to expect gratitude in return for the good deeds that one has done. But a bodhisattva, a supreme being who is intent on final enlightenment must not adopt such an attitude. Although one must strive to be grateful to others for the good that they have done for one, one should cultivate forgiveness and equanimity should others turn out to be ungrateful for the good that one has done for them. So that's why equanimity is also a parami. Determination, of course, is needed because anyone who has meditated before would know how difficult it is to progress along the spiritual path. But all of these items under paramis should be cultivated with the sole motivation of benefiting others as well as contributing towards 
one's total liberation from samsara, towards the purification of one's heart so that one can more effectively help others. So, to summarize, Gusala or good is the generic term for all these three things. A subset of Gusala would be meritorious deeds or merit or punya. And that is something which involves selfish motives, making vows for some worldly gains. And these Gusala Kama, this wholesome Kama that one has created, will definitely conduce towards the attainment of one's worldly desires, but it will not help one to attain total liberation. On the other hand, parami is another subset of kusala and a rare and exceptional subset for one. Parami is cultivated without any worldly aims in mind. One cultivates dana, moral virtue, renunciation, wisdom and so forth, not because one wants to become a wealthy person in the next life or to be born as a chakravati, a universal mona, or cultivate jhana in order to be born in the Brahma world and enjoy the peace in the Brahma world. On the contrary, one cultivates all these virtues, these paramis, so that they can help one to be totally liberated from samsara, to be purified of all defilements, so that one can be more effective in helping others. So I hope that tonight's talk will be able to help you to differentiate between these three categories of good, merit and perfection. May you attain all your worldly and otherworldly aims by being able to perfect all these virtues. There's an interesting standard blessing given by Pachika Buddhas. Vichitam bhati dandriham kepame vasamijadu sabbe burendu sangappa chando panaraso yatha mani jodhi raso yatha which means vichitam bhati dandriham may your desires and aspirations kepame vasamijadu be realized quickly sabbe burendu sangappa may all your plans be fulfilled Chando Panaraso Yata like the moon on the fifteenth night. So let us share our merits. Tonight we have done the following merits taken refuge in the triple gem, observe uh, the five precepts. Listen to the Dhamma talk, given the Dhamma talk, and other meritorious deeds. We offer a share of our merits to our departed relatives, to our guardian devas, to the guardian devas of the sasana, to the guardian devas around this area. To other devas and spirits, and to all other beings. May all beings appreciate and rejoice in the sharing of merits, and therefore be happy, well, and peaceful. Sukita hon to nyate yo. 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 Eta Sabe sata namodantu. Sabe sata namodantu. Sabe sata namodantu. Sabe sata namodantu. Sabe sata
ดีดังโนปัญญังดีดังโนปัญญังดีดังโนปัญญังดีดังโนปัญญังดีดังโนปัญญังดีดังโนปัญญังดีดังโนปัญญังดีดังโนปัญญังดีดังโนปัญญัง